Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, we're so glad you guys are here joining us in person. I know people are tuning in online, uh, and we're glad you braved the cold. Uh, we know it's we know it's a chilly day, but we're glad you're here. This is a reminder: we are doing communion today. So if you don't have your communion elements, they are right outside those doors, um, and we can. Uh, if you guys would go get those, you can top off coffee while we're playing our first song. Um, but we would really enjoy you guys worshiping with us. So that being said, let's go ahead and if you aren't already and worship together this morning. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, church family. It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. I'm Pastor Rebecca. I have a couple of quick announcements for us this morning. But like Colin said, it is Communion Sunday. So if you have not grabbed your communion elements, they are right outside in the foyer. Make sure to grab those for later in the service. And if you're at home, grab some elements so you can participate with us as well. It does not have to be these little cups to participate in communion. Whatever you have, God knows. So, a couple announcements. Today is Alabaster Sunday. You may have seen the box outside and the little bitty chapel. So please donate Alabaster offering today. You can donate online as well by as dropping off offering into those boxes. Alabaster is something that we as the Church of the Nazarene love to participate. This money goes to building schools, hospitals, homes, churches in countries that need it. And you guys get to be a part of that. So please participate in that with us today. Another thing that's really big in the Church of the Nazarene is Faith Promise Sunday. And that is coming up next month on February 25th. We're going to have Reverend Rob North here with us that morning. It's going to be an awesome time. He'll be in a combined Sunday school that morning at 9 a.m. where he'll be able to go a little bit more in depth than he can during the 10 a.m. service. Then he will also join us at 10 a.m., So be praying about what God is laying on your heart to make your pledge. This is something that we are pledging to support missions. And we will have all of those pledge cards that day. So please be praying about what God may be having you to pledge this year. And my final announcement this morning before we get back to worship is church board elections are coming up on February 11th. If you are a member here at Northside, 15 and older, you are able to participate in these elections. We are very excited about it. In the next couple of weeks, we will have handouts on the Welcome Center telling you who all is nominated for this year's board. So please check those out. If you're a member, please be here on February 11th to vote. Your opinion matters in your church board. That's all I've got. I'll hand it back over to Colin. Amen. Let's continue to worship this morning. Amen.
before we move on to this next song, uh, uh, I just feel like it, it's pressing on me this morning that we we just sing about how God does great things. Here in just a second, we're going to sing about how even in moments when we don't see him, don't hear him, don't feel him, he will be there. He will triumph. We will worship him. Uh, and I want to just take a moment real quick. There are prayer requests you are praying about that you don't know how, what the ending looks like, right? There are things in your own life that you are going through struggles. Uh, I see a perfect example, second to back row here in the middle. Uh, Mr. Tommy, we've been praying about him for weeks, and here he is. Uh, yeah, amen, right? And I feel like God's just wanting to tell you, whoever it is, maybe it's one of you, ten of you, all of you, that whatever you're going through, God's already got it. He does great things. Don't, don't belittle that. Have faith. Have hope in this moment. I continue to be in this place. Help us to see breakthrough in our lives this morning. Whether we're here in person, whether we're watching online, when and wherever we are, let us count on you because we know the battle's already won when it's when you're in, in charge, when you're fighting it. If it takes hitting our knees in front of you, God, let us hit our knees in front of you. same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God is never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Let's sing this together. Yes, I
You may be seated. I'd like you to take your communion cups. We'll get to those in just a second. Would you? That music is just softly playing. Colin has identified people are going through stuff. And if you're not personally, our world is going through stuff. And yet we are here to proclaim that God is bigger than all of that. God is working in ways we cannot see. So today as we look backwards to the cross, the death of Christ, we understand that that event is as current as it ever was because he died for us. And his work then is not finished. And so as we look back, we also look forward to the fact that he is going to bring about good things in our world. Ultimately, he's bringing about his return, the setting up of his kingdom and heaven. And all of this is possible because of God's amazing love displayed through the sending of Jesus who went to the cross. You just need to be surrounded today by the fact that you got it. And the people you are praying for that seem so distant from God's love, they are loved, and there's nothing they can do about it. There's nowhere they can get to just out of the reach of God. Because his love is everywhere. Jesus, we come to you and we thank you. That you loved us this much. You loved our loved ones this much. You loved the world this much. And so it is good for us to worship you. It is right for us to worship you because you are an awesome God. And if you don't do anything else for us, you've already done enough to deserve our praise and our adoration, our worship, and our surrender. You've said to do this in remembrance of me. And so right now we remember on purpose that you went to the cross and carried our sin and our shame to a cross where you died an agonizing death to meet the requirement, the penalty. Thank you. The night before you went to the cross, you were with your disciples celebrating Passover, which you transitioned into communion. And you took the bread and you broke it and you explained to them, this is my body which is broken for you. They didn't get it immediately, but they would soon after you died and rose. And we understand it somewhat that your body was broken so that ours wouldn't be. You took our punishment. And so it's with great joy that we take this little wafer that symbolizes the body of Jesus Christ and we eat it together in remembrance and thanksgiving that you died for us. Let's eat it together. On that same meal, you lifted the cup and you said, this is my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. They were gathered in a Passover meal. They knew about blood, the, the blood that had been put above the doorpost. They, they knew about that and how that saved them. And they knew about the lambs and the bulls and the blood that would wash sins away and they were trying to figure out exactly what Jesus was saying. 
And later they understood that his death was as the Lamb of God forever slain. And that there would never need to be another sacrifice because yours was sufficient. Lord, everything that we've ever done that has been wrong is forgiven because the blood washes it away. So we're thankful. We're in awe. We're overcome by your mercy and your grace. Let's take and drink this in remembrance of Jesus. There may be someone watching here that says, I've never given my heart to Christ. There's no better time than in communion. Simply saying, God, forgive me. You don't have to have eloquent words. You just, God, forgive me and mean it. And if you didn't take communion, go ahead and take it right now. Because you are forgiven. He is faithful to forgive us when we confess our sins. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As we stay in this attitude and we're just remembering and thinking about God's... Sing with Colin this great old hymn that God just put on my heart early this morning. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promises, and to know the safe, the in the old days, someone would say, amen. amen, happy. God's good, isn't he? Yes. All the time. Even if one of the main air conditioners and heating units is broken and we're wearing a little extra layer, God's good. God's good, and he is here. And I'm thankful for you who have braved the cold 
Born in Michigan and raised in Northeast Ohio, I always chuckle when Texans talk about cold. <laughs> However, I have to admit, 17 years in the South, I now understand about thin blood and not liking cold. <laughs> Some years ago, I, I was asked if I would consider going to Battle Creek, Michigan. And I said, let me talk to the boss. They thought I meant God. I was really meaning it someone else, Penny. And when I talked to her, she said, there is no way we're going up there. I'm done with snow. But it's good to be here, even if you have a coat on, and I see some with coats on. Oh. I want us to focus for the next couple weeks on a little, the little book of Jude. We kind of mentioned that in a sermon before before the uh, end of the last year. We're going to talk about mercy for a couple weeks and how important mercy is. The book of Jude is one of the books that we often jump over. We don't pay it a lot of attention. It is one chapter. The whole book is one chapter sandwiched between the three letters of John, 1, 2, and 3 John, which are powerful, and we love that. And then, of course, on the other side, it's sandwiched between Revelation, and we love to imagine and talk about that. But this little prophetic book by a guy, we don't know who he was exactly, he says he was the brother of James. We're not sure if that's James, the brother of Jesus, or another one. It's prophetic. It, it, it's got an edge to it at times. He uses four different times this idea of mercy and how important it is. Look at verses 1 and 2. So as you look there, there won't be a chapter because there's only one. All right? So it'll just be, uh, unless that's what it, what it means. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I'm writing to all who have been called by God the Father, who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. That is an awesome phrase. Who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad for the care and the safety and the security of being in Christ? Amen? Man, that's good. He goes on and says, may God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. More and more mercy, peace, and love. In verse 20, he says, keep your arms open and outstretched, ready for the mercy of our Master, Jesus Christ. Stay ready, folks. Living in a cruel world, living in a crazy world, you better be this way, extended, open to the grace and the mercy of our Master, Jesus Christ. Mercy is essential for our lives, right? The only way we're forgiven is because God has mercy on us and gives us grace, the benefit of Jesus and forgiveness. He looks at us in pity, mercy, and he loves us and extends grace. The, the word mercy is almost always combined with love, love and mercy, and often love, mercy, and grace. And, and as you study it, and this week as I tried to dig in, because they're not exactly synonymous. They're not exactly the same, and yet they're so close that they're used interchangeably. And so there is this love of God that is this huge, perfect thing in which God always looks out for the best of the one he loves. That's us, right? So when we say God loves you, that means God's always looking out for your best loves you that means god's always looking out for your best interest he's always working for your good he's never going to do anything that is not in your eternal and immediate best interest that's good to know loving you in fact if you choose to make your 
place in hell, you'll do so remaining in the love of God. That is faithful, awesome love. And yet this love has its attributes or its, its action through mercy and grace. So mercy and grace are kind of the one-two punch of God's love. Mercy is almost always described as two words, pity and compassion. I'm seeing someone that is down on their luck, that they are homeless, they are broken, and I have a sense of pity and compassion. Grace, on the other hand, and the left hand of God's love reaching out to us, and we need them both, right? We need God's pity and his mercy, his willingness to not give us what we deserve, but also this benevolence in that he gives us grace. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us blessings even when we don't deserve it. Mercy. We, how Jude uses this word mercy. Go through this book. Mercy, the getting and the giving are essential to our security and our safety in Jesus. Who don't take the things of God seriously. Somebody ought to say, amen. Is, does that not describe today? Not taking the thing. A religion built on their own ungodly interests and desires. They will end up creating division everywhere, even splitting churches. It is happening right now. Right now, it is happening. They are following the spirit, small s, of the world inspired by Satan, not following the... Those are, those are two distinctly different spirits, and they are very much at work in our world. In the last days, people will be following the spirit, small s, of the world. Spirit, small s, of the world instead of the Spirit, capital S, of God. He talks about in the last days. How many times have you heard preachers listening to revivalists and evangelists? And, and the truth is, down through the last 2,000 years, we have been hearing preachers say, these are the last days. So very carefully... Do I venture out and say, we might need to consider that these really are the last days? Because I understand I'm standing on the shoulders of 2,000 years of preachers who've been saying that they're dead and gone, and I'm still here saying it. But it seems like, as you read the book of Jude, that the things he talks about seem to be the things that are happening in our world. I read a blog by David Jeremiah, and in it, he just put in four points what, what I believe. He said, here are four signs that we are in the last days. Let me just quickly give them to you. He said, the first is a sign of deception. 1 Timothy 4.1 says, the Spirit clearly says that in later days or times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. That is happening right now. Deceiving spirits are being followed. I mean, how many times have I rubbed my head at listening to a news report, watching something, and said, I can't believe people actually believe that. I, I, I can't, I mean, if I had hair, I'd be pulling it out. I mean, it, it's a real problem for me because I want to pull my hair out because I'm so frustrated. Um, it, people now, smart people, and I say that in quotes, smart people in our world, leaders, media types, and, and people in news, they believe things that violate the Word of God, but, but way more than that. They are believing things that violate centuries of human scientific thought. And beyond that, 
they are believing things that simply violate common sense. I mean, it's happening all the time. You, you could give me 10 examples right now. <coughs> the one I want to give you, and it's just one, is this push in our world that violates common sense, violates science, violates centuries of human understanding and thought, and violates the Word of God, and that is there are more than two genders, and that they are fluid, and you can kind of move from one to another. I, I just wonder, how is it that intelligent people are thinking this? I, I, it's deception. It's a sign of the end times. I saw a meme, or really a gif, that put it succinctly. The guy said, you know, when our five-year-old says they're a pirate, we don't cut off their leg and stab them in the eye. We understand they're five, and down the road they'll see things differently. And I know that simplistic and gifts are always that way, and, it's, and I've preached a sermon on that, and I don't want to preach that again, but... There is a spirit of deception in our world. When people who have grown up with the truth just absolutely veer off and believe everything but the Word of God, it breaks our heart. And I, he was talking to me about a fam, family member and he said about this family member, they will follow any God, small g, but they will not follow God, capital G. They'll follow any spirit other than the spirit. Of young men from Ukraine and Russia have been wiped out, never to have families, never to live. Right now, while we are worshiping Israel and Hamas, are at war. Hundreds of thousands of people are being killed. Right now, while we are worshiping Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Somalia, Libya, the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Myanmar, Colombia, and Mali are all in active civil wars where thousands upon thousands of people are being put to death. When Jesus said in the last time there'll be wars and rumors of wars, he's not kidding. It's happening right now. Right now, the U.S. is fighting against Islamic State group in Syria and Iraq, which continue to attack our ships and interests. And none of that is to mention the many wars that are on the borders including our own, and borders around the world where people are trying to escape those things and are being slaughtered. That doesn't mention the fact that China is systemically putting to death the Uyghurs, and we could go on and on with those kinds of things. The sign of international violence and war. So there's a sign of natural disasters and as I dug into this a little bit, Jesus, of course, talked about the increase of famine and pestilence. Did you know that right now famine is a serious issue in many parts of our world, especially Africa? And millions of people are in danger of starvation. In America, the incidence of people in this blessed country living at poverty subsistence and without enough food is greatly increased in the last 10 years. Did you know that from 1900 to 1960, there were roughly 10 major earthquakes every 10 years? And since then, there are major earthquakes occurring more than once a month and a great earthquake, the kind that just gets all the media attention, not just every 10 years, but every year there is one that is leveling civilizations and many people are dying. We could talk about the superbugs that keep cropping up. They keep telling other ones are coming. Natural disasters, pestilences, we don't use that word very much, do we? Yeah. 
there's a sign of persecution. And I know you know this. In 2023, 360 million Christians lived under the threat of severe persecution and discrimination. 5,621 people that are recorded were martyred for their faith. That's just last year alone. Over 2,000 churches and church buildings were attacked because they were Christian. 4,500 Christians were detained or arrested for their faith. The sign of persecution. Someone's saying, boy, you're freaking us out. I have no desire to freak you out or cause you to live in fear. I have no interest in saying what you really need to do is go off in the wilderness and dig a hole, build a log, uh, <laughs> a log and live off the grid. Now, you all probably know someone who knows someone who's doing that. They don't have cell phones. They don't have bank accounts. and they're, it, it, I'm not doing that. Jesus, come and get me because I'm going to need my phone. You know, that, that's just the way it is. Um, I don't want to freak you out, but friends, we need to live with our eyes wide open while we are attempting to follow Christ. We can't be ignorant to the things that are, happy, that are happening in our world. In all of this, let me remind you what he says. And he is writing to a people who are also in perilous times. And he writes to them in verse 2, We have been called by God the Father who loves us and keeps us safe in Jesus. Faith enables us to see the reality of a world that is getting closer to the end and not freak out. Because we know who's in charge of us and the world. He and Jesus. What does it mean to be kept safe in Jesus? Does that mean that if we are in Jesus, then, then all the bad stuff that is happening in our world will not happen to us? Does it mean that? I wish it did. W wouldn't that be cool? Have a trip to the altar, and you're immune from all this stuff. Every church would be jam-packed. You couldn't get space at the altar. No. In fact, it's actually the opposite. If you read the Word of God accurately, those of us who profess Christ and attempt to live for Him will be targeted for discrimination and persecution. That's an encouraging word, isn't it? But that's what the word consistently says about the end times. Does being safe in Jesus mean that God automatically does this and we have no part to play in the process? No. How I wish that were true. That's not true. We always have a part to play in our salvation and in our safety. Say that with me. We always have a part to play in our salvation and in our safety. And someone out there is saying, yeah, but Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for it is by grace that we are saved through faith and this not of ourselves. That's all true, but even that requires our part. I've got to say yes to Jesus. I, I've, got to, I've got to invite him in. I've got, I've got to let him come into my heart. There's always a part to play in our salvation. There is God's part, the biggest part, the most costly part, and there's our part, the receiving part. We cannot do God's part, and he will not do our part. He will not force us to follow him. We have a part to play. Throughout this chapter, he talks about our part to play. Follow along with verse 20 and 21. But you, dear friends, 
carefully build yourselves. I have in parentheses each other because depending on which version you are reading, both can be translated here. Build yourselves or each other up in this most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit, by staying right in the center of God's love, by keeping your arms open and outstretched, ready for the mercy of our Master Jesus Christ. This is the unending life, the real times. In the end times, which he thought they were living in, he was mistaken, and I may be mistaken as well. 500 years, some preacher like myself will be saying the same thing. Maybe. I don't know. But what he says about our part in staying safe is essential. Watch what he says. Build yourselves up. If you are an English teacher, you will really love to know that this is a present, active, participle and that is a critical part of grammar that says this building yourself up has to be now and it has to be ongoing. The discipleship I went through as a teenager was valuable, but it doesn't keep me safe today. What happened 20 years ago isn't going to cut it. It's got to be now. Build yourself up now. Build up is a construction word. Building a building, a home, a, a business on a foundation, which is obviously Christ Jesus. In parentheses, I put each other because it is a plural, third person plural verb. And, and we know from all the other places that discipleship doesn't happen by ourselves. It happens in community. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a part for you to play by yourself. You need to be reading the Word. You need to be praying, but it needs to be together. Why we have life groups, why we have Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, why we're trying to develop more of them so that everyone can be a part of it because you can't just be discipled by yourself. He says something interesting, that we need to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. This isn't just any faith, any belief. This isn't us sitting around life groups saying, I think this is what it means to be. No, this is 2,000 years of this is what Jesus meant. Don't mess with it. Amen? Now, there's some stuff we mess with. I'm not wearing clerical robes. We don't have an organ. There, there's all kinds of things that are different about our, 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 our sanctuaries and our buildings. And, but we can't mess with what the Word of God says. We don't get to tear pages out and say, mm, that, I'm not going to apply that. And that's exactly what is happening in our world today. The most holy faith. He goes on and saying, by praying. And so our security is by building ourselves, being active and conscious in this building process in the most holy faith. And he says, praying in the Holy Spirit. What all does that mean? Friends, we've made it harder than it is. Praying in the Holy Spirit is being dependent on God, being surrendered to God, and being led by God. Dependent, which you already are, whether you like it or not, right? I can't do this on my own. Early this morning, I was praying about some stuff going, including the air conditioning unit. God, I can't fix this. It's bigger. There is so much that we're praying about, that you're praying about, that is just way beyond your control. You can't fix it. That's why you pray and you are dependent. But being dependent or understanding I can't fix it is different than God, you can, being surrendered. I choose to give you the right to change anything about me. Praying in the Holy Spirit says, God, meddle with every attitude I have, meddle with my actions, meddle with everything I say and do. You have the right. And then it is being led. I will follow you. Praying with the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit is never self-centered. 
How many of you have spent some time in prayer and realized I'm not really praying because my praying is all about me and not what I'm supposed to be praying about? I'm complaining to God or I'm telling him what to do instead of being surrendered and led. I mean, I guess that's prayer, but it isn't prayer in the Holy Spirit because you're just kind of doing your thing while you're talking to God. It's never my will, it's God's will. It's being spirit-directed. Romans 8 tell, says that when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit prays for us to the Father, and from the Father prays into us the will of God so that we can understand what his will is. And then Jude goes on and he says another of our part, staying in the center of God's love. That doesn't mean staying loved by God because you can't get out of it. But staying in the center of God's love is a very different thing. That is purposefully living according to God's plan. Jesus said in John 15, we remain in God's love by obeying God, his commands, by producing fruit and loving others. And then the last thing he says in that little paragraph, he says, keeping your arms open and outstretched, ready for the mercy of our master, Jesus Christ. God, I'm open. Give me whatever you have. Hit me with whatever I need. Change me. I need your mercy. I need your grace. Now, I so some of us, we're not used to worshiping like this, and that's fine. You don't have to. I would challenge you someplace in the privacy of your home, just try this. Lift your hands up in this, this, this system of being open. God, I am open to you. Hands lifted up. God, give me whatever you need to give me. Lord, touch me. Change me. But in this image of lifting up our arms and making them open, he goes on to talk about showing mercy to others. So this has to become this. You get it? God, give me. God, help me give to other people. I can't have God's mercy without giving God's mercy. The New Testament says that Jesus is a light, and then later Jesus says, you are light. How does that happen? Because he's the light, he comes in us, and we become his light reflected into our world. If you want forgiveness, what do you have to do? Forgive. There is this our part to it. John makes it so clear. God is love, and if we say we love God but don't love others, we are a liar. Wow. Getting God's mercy and giving God's mercy. Next week, we're going to focus on the giving mercy. Would you bow your heads with me? The band's going to come back, and we're going to close with, with a great song. But as they're coming, I, I want you to just say, God, what do I need to take away from this scripture, this sermon? It, 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 it actually might be something that God speaks to you about that I didn't say, and that's fine. That often happens because God is active and his spirit is moving and he's and available are you outstretched god give me whatever you have for me change me in whatever way you may want to lord we thank you for the promise that you will keep us safe in jesus and yet god with every promise comes the caveat the condition we need to build ourselves up in the Holy Faith. We need to pray in the Holy Spirit. We need to keep ourselves in the center of your love. We need to get and give your mercy.
you can do a far better job of applying this to people's lives. And so right now, make it applicable. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Colin's going to lead us. We give you the glory this morning. We give you all the honor. 
all the praise. Help us to keep you with us as we go from here. Help us to continue to seek you in our day to day. We thank you and I pray. Amen. You guys are dismissed this morning.